What's going on, EV fam? Thank you guys so much for tuning in to a very, very important episode today. I'm going to be sharing my testimony with you guys and giving you a little bit of uh, background, history and background context to my life and also, you know, people in my lo- uh, family's life and, uh, you know, how generational curses had came about and also how the hand of Jesus and how the Lord's hand was always on our lives and delivered us and brought us out of tragedies and, you know, things of that nature. So, you know, I'm going to be sharing some life lessons with you guys, some personal life lessons that I've been through and experienced and that I've also witnessed others experience. And uh, let's just dive right into it. This is my testimony. And uh, I thank you guys for listening. And I truly hope and pray that this testimony would reach at least one person to give them a different perspective and outlook on life and to motivate them and to encourage them to seek God through any and everything. And that this would help change their life potentially and, and hopefully, you know, submit to God and give their life to Christ. So with that being said, let's get right into it. All right. So, you know, starting as a kid, um, you know, just a real quick disclaimer, this is not bashing or, you know, hating or blaming any of my parents or anybody in any of the stories for anything. But, um, you know, that's just a real quick disclaimer. So, um, starting from when I was a kid around the age of eight, my mom had got addicted to heroin. Uh, she started with opioids and then, you know, transitioned over to actually shooting heroin. Um, my dad was, uh, an alcoholic and he also had epilepsy and for those who don't know what epilepsy is or uh, don't understand exactly what it is it's pretty much a person that has a chemical uh, imbalance or dysfunction in their in their brain that causes them to have seizures so that right there was a generational curse you know my parents had having kids out of wedlock um, they separate after having their second kid my brother I'm the oldest of three and, um, my youngest brother, he has a a different father than me and my other brother. So like I said, they had children out of wedlock. Um, they separated and they both had addiction issues. Uh, My dad was alcoholic. My mom was addicted to, uh, opioids and drugs and alcohol and opioids are two of the hardest kind of drugs and addictions to you know, essentially get clean from and to kick the habits and addiction. It's extremely hard and difficult. So those right there were generational curses. Um, You know, growing up, it was rough, you know, seeing my mom nodding out, you know. The typical idea of when you think about Baltimore drugs and Baltimore heroin and fiends on the street, you know, watching my mom nod out in front of people, watching my dad drunk, can't even walk, um, you know, walking a straight line, having seizures every other five minutes, can't even hold a full conversation, you know, taking his uh, epilepsy and seizure medicine with alcohol. I mean, come on, guys. That just doesn't even make sense, but he did it. And... You know, saying all this, I'm not hating my parents. I'm not blaming them. And I don't love them any less. But, you know, that's just what it was. And that was the choices that they chose to make. And it didn't only affect them. It affected, you know, their kids, their parents, and everybody else that, you know, knows and loved them and had a part in their life. So with all that being said, um, you know, my, my parents battled addiction. And started when I was young. Me and my brothers were young. Um, You know, fast forwarding a little bit. My grandmother had taken me and my brothers in. And even my uh, my mom at some point. And pretty much took us all in. Took care of us. Helped raise us. Helped take care of us. Later down the line. um, My father, around 2011. He gets hit by a car. And we don't even know if he's going to make it. We get the call 
that we need to get to the hospital to potentially say our, our last goodbyes to my dad. I don't know the full extent of what exactly happened, the full detail, but what I speculate and from my understanding of what may have happened is my dad was probably drunk or had been drinking, had, uh, had a seizure, either fell out in the road or walked in the road while the car was coming and got hit by the car. Um, we didn't know if he was going to make it. We get that call. We go to the hospital to potentially say our goodbyes and, you know, give our dad our love. Um, ultimately, after all the prayer, all, the, all of the family being there, after, you know, laying hands on him and praying over him, he ended up surviving. By the grace of God, he survived, but he ended up being paralyzed. He was a paraplegic throughout the rest of his life. But it was for the better, because I truly believe that if he had not gotten hit by the car and became paralyzed, he would have still been drinking. He would have still made his life and his not, not just his life, but his body worse, his relationships worse uh, with, you know, with me. Because at that time, um, I was around the ages of understanding and, you know, coming around to know what was going on. And I was kind of. Uh, what's the word? Uh. I can't think of the word that I'm looking for, but I kind of, oh, uh, resentment. I kind of had some resentment towards him because of, you know, his choices and that he chose his addiction sometimes over his kids. And, you know, same for my mother. She chose addiction over her kids, but it, that doesn't mean that they don't love us or they, that they didn't love us with all their heart. But their addiction, their stronghold that they were in bondage to, those spirits that were keeping them in bondage and addiction, that addictive spirit to drugs and alcohol. Hence why they call alcohol spirits. I know that's, you know, that's another topic for another video, but you know, it makes sense. Um, they were in heavy bondage, creating generational curses. So he ends up getting hit by the car. He uh, is paralyzed. And that changes his life for the better. He no longer desired to drink. He no longer drank. Um, he was more, he was less of just a father and more of a dad to us. Um, you know, I started to let that resentment go. I started to forgive. Um, I appreciated him. And he also appreciated life a lot more. He appreciated the people in his life. He appreciated, he appreciated his life. And he ultimately got to see his kids uh, grow up into young men to graduate school. Uh, I also got to witness me get married and be in my wedding, which is was amazing. And I thank the Lord for that opportunity. And, uh, you know, backtracking a little bit, um, after he got hit by the car, um, my grandmother at the time had taken me and my brothers and my mom in. Um, help raise and take care of us. Uh, she was still battling and getting, trying to get clean from, you know, her drug addiction. You know, she was on methadone, you know, still trying to get clean completely. Um, but at the time she was technically sober from her opioid addiction. Um, but then she picked up the habit of drinking alcohol, which led down a whole nother down, downward spiral and another rabbit hole of Demonic spirits entering our family. Um, there's a story that I've never um, shared publicly with you guys. Um, my family had been through a dark, dark time during that period of my mom picking up the bottle and essentially replacing one addiction for another, which wasn't any better. If anything, it kind of made her life and our life collectively worse. Um, she was already a diabetic, um, you know, just battling depression, anxiety more than she ever had, had been before. So she picked up the bottle. Uh, like I said, it made life worse for everybody involved. And the story that I've never shared with people before is, um, there was a night where she was completely, she was completely, uh, almost blackout drunk and she was honestly uncontrollable and at the time i was 
I want to say 12, 13. I don't know how to handle that. When you're dealing with somebody that is drunk like that, that is literally a demon and a spirit taking over you and their body and causing them to act in a way that they would not act if they were sober. I can't remember exactly what the cause or the root cause or reason was, but somehow she came after me and legit tried to harm me. She had already thrown a knife at me before. I tried to get away from her. I was already irritated. I shut my, my room. I shut the door in my room and she came busting down my door. She broke my door down literally. And my mom was smaller than me. Like she was, she's not that big of a woman. And she broke my door down while she's drunk, which <laughs> kind of shows and proves you to you guys that you're not yourself. That's something else taking over your body. She broke the door down, coming after me, and just had evil in her eyes. Just an evil, possessed, demonic look in her eyes. And she started wailing on me. Just wow, 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 wow. And me not knowing how to handle that. And at the time, I already kind of was having anger issues and, you know, dealing with, you know, my own personal thoughts in life and growing up and, you know, through puberty and, you know, things of that nature. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, things that a young boy growing into a young man is already dealing with. And she comes in wailing on me, just boom, 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 just hitting me, hitting me, hitting me. Right hook, left hook, boom, hammer fist, hammer fist. <laughs> You know, I'm just making a joke a little bit to try and, you know, lighten the, the situation and not make it so extra dark. But, you know, honestly, uh, no, she was just wailing on me and I tried. I tried to hold her back. I couldn't. At that time, I blacked out myself. I lost it. The only thing I knew was fight or flight. And at the time she had me cornered. I could not, you know, take flight. I couldn't run. I couldn't flee. So the next and only other option was to fight. So she was hurting me. She hit me. And then she hit me one good time in my nose. And I just lost it. And I fought back. Yes, I hit my mother. Which I feel terrible about still to this day. Even thinking about it. But I... There was nothing else I could do. I didn't know what to do. It was either take the beating of my life for no reason. Like literally no reason. Just take the beating of my life by my own mother who loves me and who I thought loved me. Um, and who I love dearly. And just seeing evil in her eyes and just let her wail on me. And human instinct just kicked in and I fought back and I punched her right in her face a couple good times. She fell and I got on top of her and... You know, did what I did, you know, hitting her back and my brother had to come pull me off and essentially kind of like speared me off of her and, you know, I busted her nose and she was, uh, she was not in a good state. Um, it's the best way I can put it. So anyway, fast forwarding from that night, you know, that was just a story that I've never show, shared with anybody, you know, being completely transparent, honest and vulnerable with you guys. Um, I regret that. And I asked the Lord to forgive me, even though I felt justified in the, t in the moment. But the Bible tells us to honor your mother and father. And I should have never laid my hands on my mom. But like I said, it was either fight or flight. I was cornered. I was young. Didn't know what else to do. Didn't have nobody else to help me. So I fought. Um, you know, I later on made amends with my mom. I've apologized. Um, <clears throat> she forgave me. Fast forwarding a little bit. Um, later on down the road. Going into high school in 2017. My little brother, Anthony, was shot right out front of the house of my uh, my grandmother's house of where we were living at the time. I get the call while I'm at work, working at a pizza shop, literally making a pizza as she calls. I answer the call and she's frantically screaming, telling me Anthony was shot. My first thought was, 
my brother was just killed. Like, somebody just killed my brother because of how bad she was screaming and crying. Fast forwarding, I jet up to the hospital. And, you know, the whole family gets there. We're waiting on, you know, the doctor's word to come back and tell us whether my brother was either alive, dead, or if he's potentially even going to make it or, you know, what what his status is. We had no idea. Um, so as we're waiting, this is when I truly heard the first time in my life that I really heard the voice of God. As I'm praying, and I'm praying harder than ever, than I ever have. And I had just graduated high school. This is, I graduated June 7th, 2017. My brother was shot June 11th, not even a whole week later. I'm praying in the hospital, in the waiting room, amongst the whole family. We're all praying, you know, some together, some separate, you know, by themselves, praying to themselves. <clears throat> I hear God's voice tell me in the middle of my prayer to myself, just praying. I just was nonstop praying that whole time while, while we were waiting. And I heard God, I heard God's subtle voice tell me, son, he's going to be okay. He's going to be okay. He's going to be okay. I just kept hearing that. So I lifted my head, wiped my tears, and I said, <sighs> I took a deep breath, collected my thoughts, and I said, he's going to be okay. He's going to be okay. And I just kept telling myself that. And then shortly, uh, like I want to say a couple hours later, the uh, doctor, the surgeon that was working and operating on my brother uh, for his surgery of him being after him being shot, he came and pulled, you know, the parents, grandparents, and me uh, out into the hallway to speak with us and tell us the status. While the rest of the family waited in the waiting room. And uh, this is his exact words. I cannot guarantee that he's going to make it and survive in the later days. But I truly believe that. The only reason he is making it right now and in a better condition and that there's a possibility that he's going to make it is because God had put his hand and operated on, you know, your family, your family member, my brother had operated on him and helped me operate on him to get him more stable and to keep him alive. He said, the chances of Anthony making it or anybody that has been shot the way that my brother was shot 9.9 .9, uh, times out of 10, that person does not make it. And that doctor and surgeon said that it was a miracle, that it had to be God's hand that was working through him to save my brother. And this was an Asian guy, an Asian doctor. And I thank God for him. And I thank God for, you know, putting his hand on that operating table and helping that doctor help my brother. So after the doctor said that, I knew that God was in the presence or we were in the presence of God and that he was working on this situation. I heard his voice say, he's going to be okay. I collected it. I collected myself. I believed it. The doctor came and told us what he told us, that God was working through him to help Anthony. That confirmed it right there. I was like, you know what, Lord? You heard us. I thank you. You know, the whole nine yards. Uh, I just was amazed. Um, he ends up making it. He makes pretty much a full recovery. Um, you know, other than the fact that he lost a kidney in the process. But you can live without a kidney. Um, you know, he had back problems. You know, he never was physically the same. But he was able to walk. And he was able to live, eat, breathe, uh, you know, pee, poop, you know, not to be too graphic, but, you know, to use the bathroom on his own and essentially, essentially made a full recovery, you know, other than, the, other than the fact that he lost a kidney and, you know, had a messed up back, but he essentially made a full recovery. <sighs> so that was the first time I heard God's voice. And not only that. Another crazy thing that happened in that situation, 
And a couple days later, while my brother is still in the hospital, I'm at a gas station and I come across some random older gentleman and uh, that gentleman and that gentleman at the time was coming out of the gas station as I was walking towards to go in the gas station. And he stops me and, um, you know, I can't remember exactly the small talk that he started off with, but I'll never forget. He asked me the question of, is there anything that I'm going through in life or anything that he can pray for? And I mind you guys, this was an older gentleman, about the same size as me. And I'm not that tall. I'm like five, six. Um, I'm literally talking to the man and he says, is there anything I can pray for you for? Or are you going through anything? <clears throat> And I say, I mean, as a like, as a matter of fact, yeah, uh, my brother was just shot a couple of days ago. He's still in the hospital, you know, trying to recover. There's still no guarantee at the time that he was going to make a full recovery. But, you know, the chances were looking better as the days progressed. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, the man said, OK, well, you know, can I pray for you and, well, and your brother and for the situation? And this guy. The old guy was blind in one eye. And you know when somebody's blind in one eye that it's, you know, gray and, you know, discolored from the other eye. And um, you could just tell. You know when somebody's blind in one eye. So he was blind in one eye. And an older guy, I've never seen this man a day in my life. And still to this day, I've never seen him after, after this encounter. And as he's praying, I just feel this overwhelming peace during the prayer. And weight lifted off of, and burden lift, lifted off of my shoulders. That while he was praying for my brother's healing and praying that the Lord continue to walk with us and be with us and be with my brother, it was a feeling I can't even describe. And I truly, still to this day, believe that that was an angel sent from God in the form of a human to speak to me, pray with me to the Father. And also reassure me to not dwell and worry and leave it to God. Amazing. It's three different things. Me hearing God's subtle voice. The doctor and surgeon coming out telling us that it had to be God. Because Anthony should not be here. Then, a couple days later, having that encounter with a random guy that was blind in one eye. That was an angel in disguise. But I truly believe to this day. Fast forwarding, my brother makes a recovery. He ends up graduating. Then, uh, what happened? What was the next thing? Oh, in 2020, hmm. Hmm. the year of 2020, man. So during that time, I was, you know, selling weed, uh, you know, just living a terrible life. I was making, you know, secular music. I was a rapper, um, music artist. And, uh, one day coming home from work, I went to go, um, you know, essentially hit a sale for some some weed, some marijuana. And I had a gun on me. I had a a handgun, an unregistered handgun. And at the time, I was already a felon. I had I had been arrested a couple times uh, for possession of marijuana, which is, you know, stupid. And also for some, I don't even know how somehow I got uh, labeled for having a narcotic. Don't even know where that came from still to this day. But I ended up having a felony because of that, and I copped out to a, a plea deal, and I was young and ignorant to the law. I had no idea what I was copping out to. I just didn't want to go to jail. So I copped out, didn't know it was to a felony. Stupid. Anyway, it was to a felony. 2020, um, I'm going to go hit the sale. I have a handgun on me. I'm already a felon, not supposed to have it. It's not registered, and it's loaded in the car. And I have marijuana on me. I go around the car as I'm driving. One, I cross a double solid uh, line to, to pass the car. And I speed. So I sped past the car and I crossed the line. Didn't see that there was a cop on my left hand side sitting in, in a little cut in the dark. And he sees me, you know, do what I do. Hits his lights, follows me, pulls me over. Smells marijuana in the car, has the right to search the car, searches the car, finds the gun and marijuana. I go to jail. Boom. Lock up. I'm a felon. I think I'm 
going to at least do three years. At least do three years. I should have done three years. Most people, almost everybody I know that have been caught with a gun, even if they're not a felon, at least do a year or two. But as a felon, I should have at least done three. But by the grace of God, when I tell you guys, when I was arrested in jail, I prayed so hard. And not to mention, I didn't just get arrested myself. My wife was in the car with me and she got arrested. Now, granted, she was only in jail for like a week. And I was in there a month until my habeas corpus, which was like another bail review. They let me out and I had to be uh, monitored um, and had to call in to a PO up until my court date. But when I before I was um, released after that month, um, you know, I lost my job, a good job that I had. I lost that from being in jail for so long and for the through the natures of the charges. You know, the job couldn't keep me. But when I tell you guys, I was in jail praying, praying so hard, like almost as hard as I've ever prayed close to when my, my brother and my dad was, you know, in their near death experience and situation. By the grace of God, I got out. Fast forwarding a little bit, you know, I, in jail, I had met uh, a really close friend. We became really close. And um, shortly after we got out of jail, I want to say a few months after we got out of jail, we stayed in contact. He was a good guy. He reminded me a lot of myself. He ended up be, uh, getting killed over an eighth of weed after we were released from jail. And that really messed me up. Fast forwarding a little bit more, my court date. My lawyer was drinking buddies with the judge. Now, I for sure thought they were going to either put me on house arrest for a year or something. Like, I had to do some kind of time, something. But by the grace of God, my lawyer was drinking buddies with the judge. Good friends. Now, the judge already had predetermined what he was going to do with me in my case. And I think that he's seen the good in me, that I'm not a criminal, that I don't deserve to be in jail, and that I do have a loving family, and that I'm not the person that I was portraying to be. So ultimately, he let me pretty much essentially be get off. I got off, but I still was convicted of the felony of carrying an illegal firearm, a pistol, and... I was on three years supervised probation. I definitely, you know, had to check in, do P test, uh, you know, the whole nine yards. But essentially, I got off. That that was nothing compared to having to do time in jail or being on a uh, house arrest or anything like that. So essentially, I got off. Did the three years probation. Got through that. Also, during that time of going through uh, my trial and making music, and you know, the whole thing that I had explained a couple a couple minutes ago, I had another friend that I was actually close with, that I looked up to, that was kind of like a big brother to me, especially musically. His name is David King, also known as D-Dave. He was shot and killed for mistaken identity. So that's two good friends that I lost back to back while dealing with a court case on that it was on my back and on my shoulders that was kind of overwhelming before I knew what the outcome would be. Then, shortly after that, after the court case, someone that I looked at and viewed as family and a cousin named Tion was shot and killed by the ex-boyfriend or current boyfriend or whatever he was to the woman over a female. And I believe at the time he was 21, something close to that. I can't remember exactly the age, but he was killed way too young. So that's three deaths. Back to back to back. While dealing with what I'm going through, losing a job, fighting a court case, not knowing if I'm going to go do time, do three years in jail over something stupid for one stupid petty mistake and also not living right. Then we fast forward a little bit after all that's said and done. In uh, 2022, my father ends up passing away. 
and it hurt. It was rough, but it was time. He was suffering. He had lived well past the time that they had gave him due to the uh, the injuries and effects that the accident had on him, of him being hit by a car. He lived over a decade, got to see his kids, you know, get married or his, his oldest son get married and both his kids graduate high school and grow into young men. He was ready. He was at peace and he was continuously and constantly getting infections that he just, he said he's done. He went peacefully and he was ready to go. Um, that was rough, but I got to be there and send my father off to go be with our Heavenly Father. But I was at peace with that because he was at peace. And I know that God had blessed us with an enormous amount of extra time with him. But I was at peace with that. It, it was hard, it hurt, but I was at peace. And uh, <clears throat> shortly after that, um, my grandmother, my mom's mom, she was diagnosed with lung cancer. And her mom had already been dealing with cancer. I don't, I, it wasn't lung cancer, but she was dealing with another form of cancer. And she's been battling cancer for a while, which would be my great grandmother. So my actual grandmother, my mom's mom, she gets diagnosed with lung cancer and gets um, the upper lobe of her, her lung uh, taken out because that's where the cancer was. They take her lung out. And it was just rough for her to even, you know, on me, just to tell me, um, because me and my grandmother, if you know who I am and you know her and you know us and our family, you know me and her are extremely close. So for her to even tell me that she has cancer in her lungs, it tore me up. But by the grace of God, she is doing well. She is okay today. The, from what we know, the cancer has not came back and she is still alive. And, uh, yeah, but she does struggle breathing. So if you guys would, you know, keep my grandmother in her prayers. Um, she's a strong woman, but she does need prayer. And uh, after we get through all that and that season of a rough time, later on, um, the next year in 2023, her mom ends up passing away. And she's been battling, like I said, cancer and different illnesses and, you know, the the vid. She's been dealing with the vid on and off. And she was older, so she was more fragile. Um, and she just, she, she couldn't make it anymore. So she ended up passing away, which was also painful. Um, we went to her funeral. And then um, shortly later, that same year in 2023, November 29th, my grandfather, my dad's dad, he passes away. We weren't really expecting that. But he ends up passing away. And literally right after, I'm going to say 24 to 48 hours of him passing, my mother passed. And at the time, my brother Anthony was in rehab. So we and me as the older brother, my mom's oldest, had to go visit him in rehab and break the news to him in rehab while he's already trying to recover and battle his addiction that he was going through. Because he started dabbling with, you know, alcohol and other stuff because he was battling severe depression and things of that nature. Specifically after being shot. Broke the news to him about that. But really ate me up as um, my mom talked to me and called me the night of my grandfather's passing. And I had told her that he had passed and that we were at the hospital and headed back to my grandmother's house to be with the family for a while. And she said, all right, well, um, you know, just give me a call when you leave. Um, you know, I want to talk to you when when." When, when you're done being with the rest of the family. And I said I would call, but I completely forgot. Never called. 
the next day my grandmother was supposed to pick my mom up for some appointment or something. She wasn't answering the phone all day. Uh, my grandmother, you know, just gave her the benefit of the doubt that either her phone was off, died, or she lost it, or just, you know, f fell asleep drunk because she was, you know, still battling her alcoholism and alcohol addiction. And uh, I had work that day. And then uh, the Thursday that I was at work, I headed home. Five minutes away from home, my grandmother calls me saying, hey, um, you know, would you mind coming to pick me up and taking me to your mom's house so we can just go check on her to make sure she's not home or to see if she is home because she's not answering. And, you know, I just got a weird feeling about her not answering the phone because she there's times where she doesn't answer the phone, but it's never, you know, over 24 hours where she doesn't, you know, at least call somebody or nobody's heard from her, from her or seen her. Her neighbors haven't heard her or seen her, which is very unusual because she was always with her neighbor. And, uh, you know, fast forwarding, I pick my grandmother up. And as I'm driving, I'm just thinking like, man, ma, like, come on, bro. Like, can you just answer the phone? Because I'm tired. I just want to go home, go to sleep. You know, I'm not in a mood to be dealing with no drunk bull crap. And, uh, you know, mind you, all this is happening before I am saved, before I come to Jesus. So I'm praying. I was like, Lord, please let her be okay. Just let her be okay. And I had like a weird feeling in my stomach. I didn't know if she would be okay or not. But I just thought that this was something normal because she was probably passed out drunk somewhere in the house, not answering her phone. Phone died, something. So I, I pick my grandmother up from her house. We drive over to my mom's. And as she's in the car talking, I'm just starting to get, the closer we get to my mom's house, I'm just starting to get a weird, nauseous, just raunchy feeling in my stomach. And in my heart and in my spirit, I could just feel something's wrong. We get to her house. The lights are on, but nobody is responding to the knocks. So she opens the door with her key because my grandmother had a spare key. We go in. We're looking for, you know, we look in the rooms. We don't see her. But my grandmother walks into her room and looks on the floor and sees her literally laying on the floor and screams. And I'm in the house with her. So I'm witnessing all of this. She she sees her on the floor and screams and says, Rashad, oh, my God, Tiffany, Rashad, come here. And this this plays vividly in my mind on repeat all the time. Um, It's rough. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I still battle with, uh, you know, depressing days and heartache. It's rough. And especially around this time of Thanksgiving because my mom passed a few days after Thanksgiving. and. It's coming up on a year anniversary of her passing. Um, so it's rough. I'm uh, trying to hold it together for you guys. Um, yeah. Um, uh, man, where, where was I at, man? This, this is, it's rough. Anytime I try and explain this, it, it really uh, it takes a toll on me. But, again, I'm being vulnerable and honest and transparent with you guys. Um, giving you my life testimony. Summing it up. Because, you know, this is just half, half of, you know, everything I've ever been through and witnessed in life. So <clears throat> as she finds her lying on the floor next to her bed, she screams for me to come in there and dial and call 911. I call 911, and as we're waiting on 911, we're sitting there, like, you know, just calling her, screaming, like, telling her, like, get up, get up. And we, at that time, my grandmother, she has, uh, she's educated in the uh, medical field, and she knows, she's like, Rashad, she's gone. She, you know, she's gone. Um, she was, she was, you know, blue. She was cold. She was stiff. Uh, and I don't want to make this too graphic for you guys, man. But, you know, um, finding anybody in that condition, let alone your parents, or specifically your parents, and then I also seeing the heartache from my grandmother to see her baby gone before her and to find her like that. I meant it breaks me. It, it broke me. So, <clears throat> you know. <clears throat> sorry. I guess I'm trying to keep it together for you guys. Fast forwarding, <clears throat> fast forwarding a little bit. Got a knot in my throat. Fast forwarding for you guys, uh, after that night, 
I broke the news to my baby brother. That broke my heart. Uh, you know, fast forward on a little bit more. As the days go by, I just keep hearing, you know, this voice telling me the wages of sin is death. And the wages of sin is death. Literally, the wages of sin is death. At the time, I was, I was not saved. And I just kept thinking and hearing the wages of sin is death. And I, at the time, I also was not in my Bible. I didn't know scripture like that. I hadn't submitted to God. I haven't read my word. And right here in Romans 6.23, it quotes, and I quote, and it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I just kept hearing it. The wages of sin is death. And I truly believe that that was the Lord putting his word on my heart and in my mind to tell me to change my life, give my life to Christ before it's too late. Because you never, you never know when your last breath will be, when your last day on earth will be. You never know. So why jeopardize your salvation and risk it when you could come to Christ, put your faith and belief in him, put him first and above all? All the wicked ways that I had lived and the wicked things I've done in life, I just reflected and it broke me down. My mom's passing, you know, all these other people passing, you know, all the stuff that happened in life, all the, the sickness, the illness, you know, the back-to-back -back tragedies, and also how I seen God work in my family's life and in my life and deliver us from so much. At that point, I was so broken. I just said, Lord, I can't do it no more. I give everything to you. I quit selling weed. I threw away all the, the rest of the uh, weed that I had. It wasn't much, but what I had, I threw away. I never went back to re-up. Um, I stopped living such a sinful lifestyle. At that time, I had already stopped smoking weed. I gave that up. Gave up making music. I just didn't have the desire to make the secular rap music anymore. You know, glorifying money, sex, you know, just more sin. I gave it all up. I couldn't do it no more. I was broken. And, um, you know, those simple words for the, the wages is, of sin is death. Those simple words and everything that I've been through and that I've witnessed, witnessed my family go through and others go through and other families go through. So, yeah, that ultimately led me to put my faith completely in Jesus. I completely submitted the will of my life to Jesus Christ. And ever since I made that commitment, I've had such a peaceful understanding. I've gotten in my word and I found refuge and the Lord. And I would not ever go back. If we lean on ourselves and our own understanding and our own strength and our own might, we are going to fall and we're going to fail every single time. But the one who will never fail and has never failed me or my family is Jesus Christ. Now, if I can find peace, if I can find joy, if I can still find the will, the strength, and willpower to smile, to be happy, to enjoy life. After all this, I believe all of you, if not one of you, can at least find the same joy and take this message and this story and apply it to your life. And yes, life can always be worse. And that's another thing. No matter what we go through, there's always somebody out here that's going through something worse than you. Keep God first. Pray and trust in him. And let his will be done. Now I was blessed with. A beautiful baby boy. My first child. He is healthy. He is thriving. Growing fast. Way too fast. Um, but. Being a parent. Being a dad. 
witnessing being a parent is just amazing. It's beautiful. And, you know, my brother Anthony, he's currently locked up right now um, in jail for, you know, charges that I'm not even going to, you know, put out there right now. Um, if you know, you know. If you don't, you know, we can speak per- uh, privately and personally. But I'm not going to air this to, you know, essentially the whole world because it's not everybody's business. Uh, but he's battling charges. He's in jail right now. And, uh, yeah, you know, we're still going through stuff as a family. So I just ask that you guys, you know, take heed to this message and the story and my story and my testimony. Take the Lord Jesus Christ as your refuge. And, uh, yeah, man, that's pretty much my story. And as of right now, I'm walking this walk out in this journey with Jesus Christ, and I'm not going to turn back. Am I going to be perfect? Absolutely not. Nowhere near it. But we are made righteous because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to try everything in my power and by the power of the Holy Spirit to not live in sin or habitual and continual sin. If this story is powerful and it helps you, please comment down below and let me know. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and share it with others. And if you haven't already, please make sure you hit that subscribe right here in this corner. Also, YouTube has some recommended videos right here for you guys if you like Christian content and would like to view some more videos. I love you. I'll see you guys on the next one. Peace.